talking with the experts? It's a very, very good question. And I think storytelling should permeate everything that we do in the, in the right, um, in, in, the, in every business, storytelling should be there. And I think naturally everyone tells stories, don't they? And if you look back to uh, Paleolithic times, what, what you find is what once fire started to be a thing, once fire had been discovered, um, and you look at how language was structured around time of day, during daytime, um, all of the, the Paleolithic people during the day would be just talking to pass on information. And about around about 90% of the language used was information uh, processing language. And then when they sat down around the fire, that would switch. So only about 10% of the language used would have been uh, used to pass on information. 90% of it was storytelling. Talking with the Experts. Hello and welcome to Talking with the Experts. My name is Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. Talking with the Experts is about all things business by business owners for business owners. And you can find it on all good podcasting, streaming platforms and on YouTube. And I would really appreciate uh, your help in oh, sorry, promoting my, my channel by going and subscribing and Digging on the bell so that you know when I upload new videos. Today, my guest is Paul Furlong. And Paul helps listeners to master the power of storytelling so they can inspire, influence and succeed. Now, Paul is a global authority on corporate storytelling, having combined his storytelling knowledge and experience from the film and TV industry with his sales and marketing expertise and know-how from his corporate work. He is the author of Rule the World, Master the Power of Storytelling to Inspire, Influence and Succeed, and gives public and corporate seminars and conducts live and virtual training programs on storytelling around the world, and has shared his insights on numerous podcasts and various publications, including Entrepreneur. Paul is an RTS award-winning producer, is a member of PACT and RTS and is a founding member and sitting on sits on the board of the Producers Collective. In his spare time, you'll see him running around the wilds on the beach. They, they have beaches in England? Oh, dear. Okay. Yeah, chasing, after his, funny, but... <laughs> chasing after his two daughters, trying to remain philosophical about Everton season. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great, uh, yeah, you can remain philosophical for the season trying. <laughs> Finishing after the third round of the FA Cup every year and watching foreign films at the cinema with his lovely wife, Amy. Good morning, Paul. Good morning or afternoon as it is evening. where you are. <laughs> evening. Evening where it is. Yeah. Wherever in the world you are, hello. 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 <laughs> hello. So tell me how you got into... Uh, the film and um, the television world in the first place. What prompted you to take that track? Well, it started when I was very, very little. So my parents moved me and my brother out a very rough part of uh, Liverpool to a much nicer part of the city to give us more opportunities. But in doing so, uh, it cost them everything in order just to put a roof over our heads and food on the table. So mum was working five jobs, dad was working two um, and uh, and that didn't uh, afford us furniture in some rooms. It didn't afford us carpet on the floor in some rooms, and it certainly didn't afford us any toys. So my brother and I would play make-believe for hours on end. And um, 
and that that was great. So we we dress up in like scarves from mom's uh, wardrobe, or we get snapped twigs off trees and use them as lightsabers and what have you. So make believe was everything that we did. It was just making up stories and playing. And before bed every night, my dad would read us stories from his childhood, um, rather than the new books that we couldn't really afford to buy. So it was stories that had really stood the test of time. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia, which I'm now reading to my daughter and I'm loving it. Um, Lord of the Rings, all those great, great stories. And uh, and occasionally, if there was a little bit of spare cash, we would be taken to the cinema, um, which is what my parents loved to do when they were dating before we came along. Um, and to be able to see this massive, uh, the, the story played out on a massive screen was just magical for us. And because it didn't happen very often, it was life-changing. It didn't matter what the film was, apparently. I would sob when the film finished. Whether, whether it was a good film or not, um, just the fact that the experience was over was just devastating to me. Um, and so these would make part of the stories that we would then play out um, as, as Daniel and I were growing up. And then I remember very distinctly when I was 11, my parents showed me the film Edward Scissorhands. I don't know if you've seen that, Rose, but it was life-changing for me. Not just the story that was being told, but how the story was told, how the music added to the storytelling, how the the props and the set design and the costume design all added to that story to make the film greater than the sum of its parts. And it was at that point that I said, that's what I want to do for a living. I want to tell stories for a living and I want to do it on the screen. So I spent the next kind of four or five years as a pre-internet working out how films were made uh, using Encarta or something like that to, to work out what a best boy did or what a gaffer did. or And I knew all of it. But then when I was about 15, as good parents do, they sat me down and uh, suggested that uh, film wasn't uh, a viable job for me. Uh, and that was good at science and I should perhaps focus on getting a, a real job. And um, so uh, I ditched my love of, uh, never ditched my love of film, but I ditched my uh, pursuit of film as a career, focused on science, went off to university to uh, to do a degree in physiological science. So uh, if you want to know how the structure of any of your organs relates to its function, um, no, I don't think very many people do, but I can, I can tell you all about that. I spent three years studying that. Um, but I realized while I was doing that, I didn't particularly um, enjoy it. It wasn't storytelling. It wasn't people focused. It was microscope focused. And I spent more time looking down the microscope than I did interacting with humans and, and everything. So in my second summer, I got all my mates back home together and we made a film. Didn't know what we were doing, but we gave it a go. And uh, it was great. It was the best experience of my life up until that date. And uh, we put a premiere on and we got press there and we did, we did it properly. And it was superb. And then I finished my degree. We did it again the summer after. And that was great as well. And then out of uni, I walked straight into a job in television. And I've never looked back. And uh, I've made... TV for BBC ITV Channel 4 over here in the UK um, and they've gone all around the world now some of the ITV stuff that I've done is is translated into uh, around about 12 different languages um, which is great I've had films at the Cannes Film Festival um, we've won awards for films that we've done so it's great and I've also then got the corporate company which keeps everything ticking over which is nice and we've worked with like Subway and Formula One and companies like that as well so it's, um, it's wow. great. What a what a resume! I'm like, that's impressive, absolutely. So, what got you into, I guess, uh, combining it with marketing? Uh, I think that the the honest truth is that film and television is um, is and can be quite fickle, um, and it can also be very. Uh, it's incredibly hard work. So, the first show that I worked on. Uh, it was a, a kid's show for uh, CITV over here in the UK. Uh, and it was a six-month contract. And it was unbelievable. Loved it. But you work in maybe 15 to 18 hours a day, depending on, on, on your role, for six months. And so by the end of it, you're absolutely knackered. You're, you're completely exhausted. And it takes a couple of, couple of weeks to recover. And during the time you're on your contract, if you don't have an agent, which I didn't at the time, then you're, you're stuck because you can't look for your next contract while you're on the job. And when you finish the job, you need two weeks just to recover. And then you have to go and find your next contract. And thankfully, I was able to do that after the two weeks and I moved into my next contract very, very quickly. Well, that's no way to live when you then get married and get a mortgage and have kids. 
Um, so I was finding that sometimes I'd move straight on to the next contract and sometimes there'd be a six month gap between contracts. And when I was single and there was no responsibilities, that was fine, but it wasn't a sustainable way of living. So I had a, a break from TV for a couple of years where I became a marketing manager, um, for a, a, a tourism company. And I didn't, I liked the marketing side, but I didn't like the industry that I was in particularly. I didn't like the company that I was working for particularly. Um, I like the people, but you know, it, it was just a, it was just a job. And uh, I, I was desperate to get back into film television. And I thought, well, do you know what? I can combine these two. If I start my own company, I can keep my hand in with the film and television. I can create a sustainable living. Little did I know how much hard work that was going to be in, particularly in the first couple of years. And, um, and I can combine the marketing side of it and I can create corporate film um, for companies. I can put my marketing knowledge that I've gained through the marketing uh, career that, if you want to call it a career, a couple of years that I've had and all the courses that the company put me through, which was great, um, with the, the film side and all the knowledge that I'd gained there. Um, and so that's what I did. So I, I set up Opus Media and we, um, and we combined the marketing, the storytelling, the film and that was eight and a half years ago, and uh, and we're still going. We started with with very small companies, and we still work with SMEs and and small companies. And then uh, we're very lucky on from time to time to work with the likes of Subway and Formula One and Panados yeah. and companies like that. Cool. Well, you know, it's good that you can combine two things that you like doing. Not Absolutely. Everyone has that um, has that choice, so it, it's good. So I guess for, as a business owner, how can we combine? our love of what we do with storytelling? It's a very, very good question. And I think storytelling should permeate everything that we do. In the, in the right, um, in, in, the, in every business, storytelling should be there. And I think naturally everyone tells stories, don't they? And if you look back to uh, Paleolithic times, what, what you find is what once fire started to be a thing, once fire had been discovered, um, and you look at how language was structured around time of day, during daytime, um, all of the, the Paleolithic people during the day would be just talking to pass on information. And about around about 90% of the language used was information uh, processing language. And then when they sat down around the fire, that would switch. So only about 10% of the language used would have been uh, used to pass on information. 90% of it was storytelling. And that would be talking about the day. It would be talking about uh, trading with other uh, tribes nearby. And it would be passing on um, uh, myths and legends and history of the, the tribe so that that would continue. Um, and I think, obviously, we don't have the same uh, the same kind of distinction between day and night anymore but when we're sat around the office and when we're talking to clients and when we're talking with team members and when we're talking to anyone that we're looking to inspire or sell an idea to or sell a product or a service to then we need to make sure that we're combining the information with storytelling because it's the storytelling that is the emotional component of of what we do in our communication and as, as we all know, it's the emotional part of the brain that's going to make the initial buying decision. We might then use our kind of our, um, our intelligent part of the brain to rationalize it a little bit, but it's the emotional part that's going to do the initial buying uh, decision. So we need to use the emotional part of storytelling in order to be able to, uh, to get that information across first and not just do the facts, figures, and everything else. So regardless of what we're doing, whether it's something that we love doing, whether it's just a stopgap career uh, to get us to the next bit, or whether it's something we absolutely hate, we should all be telling stories. And actually what you'll find is as you start telling stories and as you start getting better at telling stories, you'll find that whether you hate it or whether it's okay or whether you love it, you'll find more love for what you're doing because you'll find that that storytelling and that ability to tell stories becomes better and better and better. Now, what happens if there are a logical person like me um, and you know everything's logical, um, and everything's cut and dried. It's no fluff, no, you know. How do you get around and in, make your stories sound emotional? I Because my, in my copy, I've always been told by all my coaches, Rose, you're too logical, you're not emotional enough. 
how do you learn to do that if it's not something that's inherent within you? Well, there is a process. And there is a, uh, and, and I think very logical people enjoy process, don't they? And so um, you've got people who are kind of very kind of go with the flow and, and very uh, the opposite of, of that kind of logical brain. And so they might be more natural storytellers, but they might go too far the other way where they'll just waffle and, and spend so much time on, on kind of the detail of the story that that will slow things down. And that doesn't connect so well with the, the logical people, the, the really logical people. So there, there, is a, there is a whole process to this, and this is what I talk about in the book. But if I, if I break it down very quickly for you, I can talk about the, the kind of the elements, the recipe that you want to put into storytelling. So um, the first thing that you need to know is who you're talking to, who the audience is. Um, and if you think about disc profile, and you've got the, the four elements of, of who, uh, who we talk to and communication styles. So we want to follow that through in the order of DISC um, because you've got the, the detail people at the end. If you start with detail, you're going to put everybody else off. You're going to put the D and the I and the S off by putting tons of detail in straight away. So you want to start talking to the D people and then put in a little bit for the I people and a little bit for the S people. And then you can finish your story by saying, if you want more information, come and talk to me at the end. So that's really, really helpful way of doing it. Then we need to um, grab attention right at the beginning of the story. So that might be by asking a question. That might be by being really controversial at the start of the story. Um, but that's going to draw people in. There's loads of other ways that you can do that. But we want to just grab attention right at the beginning. Then we need to think about the story structure. In school, we'd have been taught that every story has a beginning and a middle and an end. And I'm sure you've heard so many different stories where someone starts a story and it sounds really great. And then there's absolutely no point to the story because they don't have an end to the story. And so you want to make sure that story structure is there. And in the book, I go into how to really make sure that there's extra structure to that. So there might be a seven, uh, seven point uh, story structure, a nine point story structure, a 12 point story structure. And that makes sure the middle bit of the story doesn't just fall flat because that's often where, particularly if it's a longer story, if you're in a presentation or something like that, the story can just dip and people get bored and kind of switch off. Um, we need to make sure that we're putting a lot of emotion into the story as well, like you said, um, and that's all about feelings of the characters in it. Stephen King says that, um, that stories that are always about the people involved and not about the things that are happening. It's how they react to the things that are happening that's most important. So it's making sure the emotion's there. And it's making sure that the, that the stories are about the, the other people, particularly if it's about a story about me, it's not to be about me, it's to be about the people that I've helped. If it's all about me, then it's just me showing off and that switches people off all the time. And then there are 11 words that all begin with C that can help us to connect more deeply with the people that are listening. So the first one is characters. That's obvious. Who's in the story? And we've kind of talked about that already. Then we've got the circumstances. So uh, where were we? Again, fairly obvious. We don't want to go into loads of detail about that, but where were we? Then the context, why were we there? So we need to know a little bit about why we were there. Was it me that caused the problem? Uh, had somebody asked me to come along and help? We need to know a little bit why we were there. Then conflict. Without conflict, there is no story. So again, you'll have heard these stories where someone tells you this story. It goes rambling on, rambling on, rambling on. You get to the end and you go, well, it's not, that's not a story. Nothing happened. There was no defining moment where somebody argued with somebody else or there was a car accident or something like that. You need that kind of bam in the middle, that conflict. Yeah, because it makes, then you, that allows... makes you go to sleep because you think, oh, mm. get to the point, please. <laughs> yeah. And you'll, I'm, I'm sure you'll have seen movies where nothing happens and you think, well, there's no, there's no conflict there in the middle. There's no story. Now, obviously, there's a few different types of conflict. You've got the Michael Bay Transformers conflict where it's all external and things explode all over the place. And then you've got your internal and your philosophical conflict where it's a lot more emotional and it's, it's a lot smaller. But often that can be, they're the ones that win the Oscars. They're the, uh, they're the movies that are like really kind of, uh, kind of tie you in knots inside when you're watching them. And, and that's great. But sometimes there's movies that don't even have any of that. Um, so make sure that your story's got conflict because that, that then allows you to apply the cure to the conflict. And again, that should be the hero of the story, not you that applies the conflict. It's you that helps them to apply the conflict, which then results in a change. And again, Robert McKee, who's a brilliant a script consultant in the movie industry, around about 30 or 40 of his, uh, his 
clients have gone on to win Oscars for best screenplay. Uh, he's an amazing guy. He says that there's no story if there's no change. So you have to see a change in emotion from the beginning through to the end. And it, it needs to kind of go up and down throughout the story. So you see that change happen because of the cure that's applied to the conflict. And then towards the end of the story, you need to tell the, the carry out message. So uh, why have you told me this story? If, you, if you're in the NLP world, you might say, well, you want to just leave the story to hang because that allows the subconscious to, to do its work. And that's great if you're sat on the top of a mountain and you've got all the time in the world to allow that to happen. But in business world, you kind of want to say, look, I've told you this story because and tell them why. And then you want to give them the call to action. So I've told you the story because now I want you to go and do this. And then peppered throughout the, the story, you want to add three things in, all words beginning with C. So the first one is conversation. At that conflict moment, you want to add in just a few little sentences of conversation because it just brings out that raw emotion. So sorry, I was telling you before about when I was growing up with my uh, with my brother and my parents sat me down and said, you need to focus on, on getting a proper job. That was the only bit where I added any conversation in because that was the, the most kind of emotionally uh, relevant bit of the story. Um, so just drop it in there in little bits every now and again. Otherwise, it becomes he said, she said, he said, she said, and it just gets that little bit boring. You need to add a little bit of comedy in. Um, obviously, if you're not a really funny person, don't add in over-the-top comedy that you're not going to be able to pull off. If you're really funny, make it funny all the way through, even if it's tragic, because that helps you with your feelings going up and down all the way through. Um, so play to your strengths when it comes to comedy. Uh, comedy is a leveler, isn't it? It brings everybody onto the same page, and it, it helps to build that rapport. So the sooner you can get it into the story, the better. That's great. And then the last C, this is the 11th C, is curiosity. So again, if you can maybe set the story up with a little trailer. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story about the time that I don't know, I was attacked by a bear or something like that at the very beginning. And then you tell the story about being attacked by a bear or you halfway through, you say, I'll come back to that later. And then you take the story off somewhere and then you come back to the bit later on. So they're the 11 C's of story that I would, uh, that I would uh, add into that process to make sure that your story is, is really connecting. And then it's all about just uh, bringing it to life with, with rhetoric and, and using really nice language as, as you go through, maybe adding odd metaphors and analogies in if it's not a story about yourself. Um, and finally, just making sure that every time you tell that story, whether it's the first time or the last time you've told the story, that you're reliving it. And if it's not a story that you that happened to you, that you get yourself into that headspace. So even if it's a story about, I don't know, the fox and the hare um, or the, the tortoise and the hare crossing the finishing line, that you embody those characters as you're telling it, and it's not just really dull when you tell it hmm. so there's a there's a, there's a good process for for processy type people and it's also okay. a good process for really over the top kind of uh people type people so that they can kind of rein it back in and make sure that it's it's really well structured yeah well that's good for all your marketing copy isn't it that's really great right. advice <laughs> absolutely brilliant advice okay so yeah you've, you've written your book have you written any others since that one so I've written that book and I wrote uh, co-authored one before that um, called uh, Success in Business and Life. I wrote that with uh, Phil Berg, Andy Gorman and Sarah Music. Um, and second edition of that will be coming out next year sometime. That's exciting. Is. So where is your book available? So uh, all good bookstores all around the world, uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Waterstones, Stones, Smith, any, anywhere that sells good books, you can get it. Wow. And the book title is, again? The book title is uh, Rule the World, Master the Power of Storytelling to Inspire, Influence and Succeed. So, everyone, you've heard the title. Go back and buy your book and get in touch with Paul because um, he's got the goods on storytelling. You heard it here first, second or tenth, I don't know. <laughs> A bit of humour there. <laughs> right. And so where can people actually find you to, um, you know, do a course, hear your podcast, do anything that, you know, relates to you? So uh, LinkedIn is a great place to connect. Um, it's just search Paul Furlong MCIM. 
Um, and I think the the forward slash on LinkedIn is Paul Furlong Opus, O-P-U-S. Um, you can connect with me through our website, which is weareopusmedia.com. Um, and there's, uh, there's a book page on there. Um, if you buy the book, there's a ton of links within the book that you can go through to get loads of extra resources, um, including um, some downloadables uh, and some extra uh, courses and, and stuff that you can book on uh, with me. Um, we've got a podcast called Rule the World, um, available on all good podcast places, uh, Amazon, iTunes, Apple, uh, which I think is what it's called now, anywhere that you get podcasts. Um, I think that's it. I think that's that's how you can get in touch. Perfectly perfect. <laughs> a lot of places. Excellent. Um, I guess any last words of wisdom, Paul? Just make sure that storytelling permeates your organisation because um, how you tell the stories internally is eventually how everyone outside of your organisation will uh, see you as well. So you're not going to be able to hide the storytelling inside because it's going to get out. So tell the stories well inside, and that's how people will see you outside. Good advice. Absolutely good advice. All right, Paul. Well, thank you so much for your time. You can go back to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for having me. Love talking with you. Yeah, lovely. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. See ya.